Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. And uh, thank you for coming to this uh, two hour stakeholders meeting of the SAVAT, the Strep A Vaccine Global Consortium. I'm Jerome Kim. Uh, I'm one of the co chairs of this activity. And I'm joined tonight by my other co chair, um, Professor Andrew Steer from Murdoch Children's Research Institute at the University of Melbourne. So, um, I'd like to keep this short if I can, uh, so that we can get on to the uh, presentations. The, the meeting will inform the Strep A community of Savoxic current activities and achievements, um, really go through some of the incredible amount of, of work that the different uh, program or work streams have accomplished, uh, discuss some of the very important issues that have been brought forward uh, in the work or highlighted in the work of these groups um, and then very importantly, open these presentations to discussion uh, so that we can get um, your opinions about uh, what progress is made, what work additionally needs to be done. And then finally, hopefully, and, and we have uh, some of the funders on the call tonight, or sorry, tonight, this morning, uh, this afternoon, uh, to really kind of uh, give people a better idea uh, of what's gone on uh, in the last uh, several years since the last stakeholders meeting. So without any further introduction from me, um, I'd like to really thank um, the work of the team. Um, you know, So Myung, um, who has organized this, uh, Jean-Louis, who has tolerated um, the executive committee and, and the other members of the uh, SAVAC um, executive committee leadership group. And, um, and then the, the very hard work of every single one of the people who volunteered to work on these work streams, because you'll see that the amount of, of uh, you see, you'll see what they've accomplished and it is really uh, remarkable and, and really a good basis for very, very healthy discussion. So uh, Andrew, I don't know if you are ready, but um, you're the first work stream lead. Thank you, Jerome. Um, and I'd, also like to um, share my thanks for all of you joining us and also to Som Young, John Louis and the team and to you, Jerome, for the work uh, that's been achieved and what we also plan to achieve. And also uh, thank our funder, uh, the Wellcome Trust. So um, it's my job to uh, chair this session um, and the first session is around the uh, SAVAC work streams. Um, and so these work streams, um, as you can see here, um, are around uh, advocacy, WHO road, R&D roadmap priorities, and the full value of vaccines assessment. But this particular session is focused on the, on the roadmap priorities. Um, and we'll be hearing about epidemiology and burden of disease of strep A, correlates of protection and uh, safety assessments relevant to vaccines. And so I'd like to begin by introducing Professor Jonathan Karapetis, who'll be talking to us about the epidemiology and burden of disease work stream. Uh, Jonathan is um, a paediatric infectious disease physician by training and director of the Telethon Kids Institute in uh, Perth in Western Australia. And uh, Jonathan's a leader in this strep A field and in and vaccine development in strep A. And so it's a great pleasure um, to introduce Jonathan. So over to you, Jonathan. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Jerome. It's great to be here. And thank you to all of you who are participating all around the world. I'm going to try and share my screen. So this is a, a piece of work that has been um, uh, a, a kind of a labour of love for a number of people involved. Our aim of this work stream is to get updated estimates of the burden of strep A diseases around the world. And there's five sp specific objectives. We wanted to begin by focusing on getting the case definitions right and updating some previous versions of disease surveillance protocols. I'll get onto that in a second. Uh, we obviously are keen to maximise and collate existing sources of global strep A disease data. Um, and part of the aim of this is to raise awareness of the burden of disease globally. 
Uh, and then we wanted to make sure that we had a, um, a collaboration, a global collaboration of key stakeholders, regions, jurisdictions uh, to become part of this working group with the aim of then getting specific proposals around priority pieces of work to assist future disease burden studies. So just very briefly, hopefully most of the people on this, um, this, this meeting understand the breadth of strep A diseases. Uh, it's of pretty much patho all pathogens. It's the one with the broadest range of diseases from superficial right through to local invasive toxin mediated, immune mediated diseases. So disease burden for strep A disease is a pretty, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big task. And of course, the question is within all of these different pieces of work that need to be done, what would be the priority pieces? There have been um, attempts previously to try and pull together overarching estimates. This is really a, a, an attempt that was pulled together a few years ago to update previous estimates that were largely from a, a publication in the Lancet Infectious Diseases in 2005. That was a piece of work um, that was done under the auspices of the World Health Organization. But then there's been a number of other pieces of work since then, particularly the Global Burden of Disease Study that's pulled together rheumatic heart disease estimates, a number of systematic reviews. And so there's been, you'll see um, estimates around the number of people affected by all these different diseases. There's been an estimates of the number of new cases each year and deaths each year. But there are also significant um, holes in the data and particularly data from some lower middle income countries, hence the aims of this um, working group. This is the names of the people who've really been instrumental and the people at the top have um, really been fantastic. Uh, Hannah Moore, Jeff Cannon, Kate Miller, Becca Trauman and Amy Scheel have really been the engine room. And we have this working group here that's co-chaired by myself and Chris Van Beneden. And you can see the names of the other people who are listed as part of the disease burden working group. The three major priorities I wanna talk about today are that de developing those case definitions and surveillance protocols a new concept that we want to introduce you to called a data purpose matrix. And also out of that, um, the list of priority projects that appear to be emerging. So back in um, 2008, a joint working group of the World Health Organization and NIAID developed some standardized disease surveillance protocols for strep A diseases. There were two sets of these, one for acute diseases, pharyngitis, impetigo and invasive infections, one for the autoimmune sequelae, rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease, and post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Um, those were published on websites, but they were never really widely circulated or used, uh, but it was a significant piece of work. And so what our working group is doing is updating these uh, and in indeed uh, preparing them as standalone chapters. And so I've listed all the standalone chapters there. We've added some extras. So we've added a, a chapter on cellulitis, and also we are uh, likely to, pr to produce an additional chapter on scarlet fever, either on its own or as an addendum to the pharyngitis chapter. So this is a piece of work that we think is really critical to, allow, to enable people around the world to undertake surveillance in a standardized, harmonized way. And there are a number of pieces of, of specific updates that we've, um, we've undertaken. And so this is really where we're at in terms of the progress. So the, um, we've completed the uh, initial reviews and revisions for invasive disease, rheumatic heart disease and impetigo. We've um, got the others in progress. Uh, we've also um, then had a first review by the disease burden working group of some of these. Uh, the, the aim is then to get um, a second review by a, a number of expert subcommittees that we have. And I'll, I'll mention those in a second with the aim then to merge them into one document, um, have a final review or pre-final review uh, initially by the, the working group chairs and then by the executive committee of SAVAC with a view to try and getting these out on websites, but also in a peer review journal uh, in the second half of this year. So this will be a, this is a very important piece of work that has made considerable progress. So that's the surveillance protocols. The, the, the next thing that's come out of this work is what we're calling the data purpose matrix. And this really arose from some thinking around trying to understand what data are needed to advance vaccine development and implementation by different audiences. And out of that, what are, where are the current gaps in knowledge through systematic reviews of disease endpoints? And that's a piece of work that you'll hear about later through the FVVA work stream. And, and also what exist, existing data are out there that we could, be, could leverage. 
with the aim of trying to understand what are the priority pieces of data that need to be collected in this very broad um, spectrum of strep A diseases. And so what we've done is try to look through the lens of different objectives for advocacy, for the regulatory and licensure aims, through policy evaluation and post-licensure and through financing. So each of those different lenses points you to different target audiences, points you to different um, priority pieces of work. Um, and what we've tried to do is to then um, understand where this all fits on the vaccine pipeline timeline. So again, that sort of sense as to the timing priority, um, what the purpose of the data are. And we've also, for many of these endpoints, tried to understand whether there are different requirements for high versus low and middle income countries. We've done this overall for strep A and then separately for seven separate disease endpoints. The aim is to use a, a matrix as a systematic approach to prioritize the future data activities. What we've then done is use this data purpose matrix, had discussions amongst the disease burden working group, also looked at the current work that's under the FVVA work stream that you'll hear about with the aim of trying to identify what the priority areas are for future research and activities. And we've done this by identifying nine different broad priority areas, uh, in incidence of invasive strep from low and middle income countries, cellulitis, uh, record linkage, pharyngitis, and you'll see the rest there. We have got to the point of trying to do an initial ranking. And so these are the ones that appear to be uh, seen by our working group with this sort of approach as the priority pieces of work that need to be done. First, establishing sentinel surveillance sites for pharyngitis and impetigo, particularly in low and middle income countries. Those would then be obvious sites for vaccine clinical trials. Describing the incidence of invasive strep A disease in low and middle income countries, a really big uh, area where there's a paucity of data. Understanding the attributable fraction of strep A in cellulitis in different settings. Cellulitis in the studies that have been done appears to be a major contributor to strep A disease burden and enlisting the, the assistance of the IHME Global Burden of Disease Project to undertake strep A um, Global Burden of Disease Estimate using their methodology. And there's also an additional important area of understanding the way that decision-making is made around vaccines in countries, regions, and globally. There are some other more lower hanging fruit, particularly the record linking studies that we think are, are probably also important. And so our next steps are to, out of this initial ranking, we want to finalize the priority ranking, identify interested individuals and collaborators and networks for each project. And if any of you are interested, please let us know. Develop concept notes for each project, identify avenues for funding support, and actually progress disease burden projects in these priority areas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and uh, uh, fantastic to see such uh, a comprehensive approach to this area and um, look forward to some further discussion during the Q&A session. And so just on that, um, just as a housekeeping note, so um, as participants, you can freely provide questions or ask questions or provide comments at any time in the Q&A box. Um, so just click on that Q&A box and um, provide your comment and your question. Um, we can then have that list of questions available for the discussions session, which is coming up after the end of the next two speakers. Um, you can also raise your hand during the discussion um, session. Um, even though you might be muted currently, I can unmute you apparently um, and allow you to speak um, during that Q&A session. Also, if there's un unaddressed questions during the Q&A, we can answer those after the meeting. So we really want to get some discussion going. So please um, get involved with that Q&A box. Terrific. So um, my... It's my great pleasure now to introduce uh, Sharani Shriskandan, who's an infectious disease physician at Hammersmith Hospital and professor of infectious diseases at Imperial College. Uh, Sharani is an internationally recognized leader in strep A clinical and laboratory research. And it's a great pleasure to introduce her today. Uh, Sharani is gonna to talk to us about the next work stream 
which is around uh, immune correlates of protection. So over to you, Sharani. Thanks. Um, thanks very much indeed, Andrew, for the introduction. It's great. It's great to be here and see so many people from around the world. So many friends as well. So hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, what a relief. Seems to be working. Um, so my brief is to summarise the um, the work of the Correlates of Protection Group. Um, it's very much work in progress. Um, and our aim is to systematically review what is known about immunity to group A strep and the correlates of protection and what is not known. And what I'm going to do today is to summarise where we are with that um, story and also to say that we're hoping to produce a systematic review towards the end of the year. But really, it would be great to get input into this topic. So can you actually become immune to group A strep? This was always a question for me many years ago. And it seems pretty clear that actually, we look at things like scarlet fever, which is a very visible and easily recognized form of group A strep, or even streptococcal group A strep pharyngitis. Immunity seems to be acquired with age. You do not really see these disease syndromes in older people, suggesting that it would be possible to vaccinate against group A strep and become immune. Invasive disease, on the other hand, happens at the extremes of age, associated with um, naivety in the immune system and also immune senescence or skin breakdown. Unfortunately, everything that we know about um, group A strep immunity is mostly driven by our knowledge of invasive infection and systemic immunity. And that's perhaps historically linked to the fact that um, group A strep has a unique ability to grow in non-immune human blood. And so, for example, if you inoculate um, group A streptococci into human blood, they tend not to be um, phagocytosed, but in non-immune blood, without specific antibody, the bacteria grow. And this is the basis of the so-called historic Lancefield assay or whole blood assay. On the other hand, if that whole blood does have specific antibody, the bacteria are opsonized and internalized and killed. You can, um, you can model this using just neutrophils and look at neutrophil uptake of opsonized bacteria using fluorescent bacteria and examine in a very short period of time, over 45 minutes, the uptake of bacteria, uptake of fluorescent bacteria by neutrophils. And you do need donor serum, which is immune, in order to facilitate that uptake shown by the red line. On the other hand, if you remove the antibody or you remove complement from that serum, you lose the uptake of the bacteria. And the, the um, all-round positive control for these experiments is always pooled human immunoglobulin, IVIG, which works a treat at promoting uptake of group A streptococci, usually regardless of serotype. So if you use IVIG or pooled immunoglobulin from over thousands of donors as a positive control in that setting, and look at adults, adult individual sera, what you find is that around 5% of people have immunity similar to the levels that IVIG promote. Most people have some sort of variable amounts of immunity, and there are still about 5% of adults who seem to lack any measurable immunity, and this is in the blood. So what is it in the IVIG or, or pooled immunoglobulin that provides this level of protection? Well, you can look at this by an immunoproteomic approach and find that all sorts of um, uh, group A streptococcal antigens, cell wall surface antigens that are common to all um, serotypes and are found all around the world are found uh, when you do immunoproteomic um, precipitation. So it makes it even more surprising that our journey to develop a group A strep vaccine has taken so long. And maybe this is because we've been fixated on single antigens or single targets, who knows? If we look at what's known from animal models of um, invasive infection and what can protect them vaccine wise, it seems pretty clear that a whole range of um, antigenic sources can work, either whole bacteria, single antigens, combinations of antigens, and also passive immunity provided by um, intravenous immunoglobulins. Non-invasive infection, sore throats, for example, or superficial skin infections, are really the main burden quantifiably of group A strep disease. And that is what we would want to pre prevent initially by vaccination. But we know very much less about what is known relating to um, immunity to non-invasive infection. 
The way that group A streptococci um, accumulate on mucosal surfaces like the throat involves a whole range of adhesins, and maybe you require immunity against all of those to affect complete immunity in the throat. There are, of course, animal models of uh, nasopharyngeal infection, which have been done in rodents and also in non-human primates. I don't have time to review all the excellent work here, and some of you on, in the audience are listening now have done these experiments. But again, you can provide immunity with whole bacteria, single antigens, combinations, and also passive immunization. It seems pretty clear that the route of immunization may be important because we know that intranasal vaccination can generate secretory IgA, can also generate um, systemic immunoglobulin, and maybe other types of cell-mediated immunity that we know much less about. But there are many unknowns relating to human nasopharyngeal infection. When you look at children who are subject to an outbreak of pharyngitis or scarlet fever, in a classroom of maybe 34 children, you will still find that even though 50% of the children acquire the outbreak strain, the vast majority are asymptomatic, but they're carrying the strain. Only a few get pharyngitis, maybe one gets scarlet fever, and the others are maybe heavy shedders of the bacterium. So maybe this means that there's a whole tranche of different levels of immunity to different virulence factors that might provide immunity to these different situations, colonization, shedding, pharyngitis, or scarlet fever. And I'm ashamed to say that we know, we have no assay or understanding of mucosal immunity to group A strep in children. And ironically, we know far more already about COVID-19 than we do about group A strep. We do know, as I said, a little bit more about immunity in the blood, and it's been possible to adapt the neutrophil uptake assay I told you about earlier to generate an HL60 assay, which is more tractable around the world. It doesn't require uh, neutrophils, fresh neutrophils, which can be adapted to look at killing, uptake and killing of bacteria. So these are surrogates of immunity for group A strep. The whole blood assay I talked about earlier, the neutrophil uptake assay, the HL60 assay, they really provide an, a piece of evidence, if you like, about how the mechanism of, uh, uh, of immunity. But the problems with these assays are that they often are very dependent on which strep A strain you use. Some of them require fresh blood or neutrophils each time, and they've proven very hard to standardize across lots of different laboratories. Even if we think about um, immunity to virulence factors, assays of inhibition of virulence are also subject to um, different labs and different, um, they are difficult to standardize. Ultimately, for vaccine development, what we need is a correlative immunity, which um, is easier to standardize. And these assays may simply reflect the interaction between the antigen and the antibody. And they will be easy to standardize, even though they're irrelevant to immunity. They could be ELISA-based, bead-based, or some sort of other type of plate assay. And I know that many people around the world are trying to develop these at the moment. So what role do correlates protection play? They provide a surrogate indicator of vaccine efficacy in situations where international standards are required. They can actually replace the need for a clinical endpoint in a trial, and provided that they are subject to regulatory acceptance. That means that you don't have to wait for the endpoints of development of pharyngitis or, goodness knows, <laughs> development of rheumatic heart disease. And it does allow ongoing surveillance of immunity in target populations. But one of the things we've identified in our work is that there are a larger number of gaps than the things we actually know about. We still need to identify the key antigens to be used in such an assay of correlative protection and also ensure that there are control antigens that are included in such assays. I believe that we need to then relate those assays to established opsonic or inhibitory assays to know how they compare with the established assays. We can look for signals in populations or vaccinated cohorts, but what we do need to know more about is mucosal immunity and pharyngitis in both children and hopefully in the human challenge model that's being developed in Melbourne. We need to develop assays for mucosal secretory IgA, but what antigen to look for? We also know very little about T-cell and B-cell mediated immunity to group A strep, and it may be that we can look at tonsils or PBMCs for that. We should learn more from the human challenge model and mouse models. We still know nothing about immunity in the skin, and we need to know and understand more about genetic susceptibility and the differences that intranasal versus intramuscular or subcut vaccination would result in uh, immunity. 
What I haven't had time to talk about today are the immunity factors that might be associated with development of autoimmune disease or rheumatic heart disease. And that's something that Edwin will touch on in the next talk. So I want to stop there by thanking you for listening and thanking all of the people who've contributed to the work so far and also to the people who are joining the team and will help us develop the systematic review. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Sharani. That was a brilliant um, overview. Um, I'm sure there's a bunch of questions that people have uh, in the audience, but we'll save those for the discussion. Um, and so, yeah, please, um, please be getting your questions ready. We have well over uh, 100 participants now on the webinar. So um, looking forward to some, um, some interesting questions that, uh, that get our speakers to um, extend our knowledge. So it's a great pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, um, Professor Edwin Asturias. Edwin is a paediatric infectious disease physician and vaccinologist. He's the Jules Aimer Chair in Community Paediatrics and Paediatric Infectious Diseases and Epidemiology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and the uh, Col Colorado School of Public Health. He's an internationally recognized expert in vaccine safety and will be speaking to us now around um, the vaccine safety approach to strep A vaccine development. So over to you, Edwin, thanks very much. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, greetings to all from uh, rural Guatemala. In fact, that's my background right now where I am. Uh, and, uh, and thank you to Jonathan who provided already uh, an overview of the burden of disease of group A strep and then Shirani who has given a, a masterful introduction in terms of the, of the uh, correlates of immunity and the approach uh, from the standpoint of uh, immunology to this vaccine. Um, let me try to, so so I think what, what we are trying to do, uh, and, and I'm gonna acknowledge at the end, the working group who has had a, a tremendous task. Uh, one of the things that really has, um, you know, a, slow or in a sense uh, at some point stop the development of a, 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 a important group A strep vaccine was the issue of safety. And what the uh, working group stream sort of uh, try to do is uh, come up with a, a framework that, that, that could help us anticipate and investigate vaccine safety for group A strep. And for that, what we would like to sort of uh, think about is that we need to take our clues from the natural history of group A strep infection, given that its complications is really part of those signals that we are trying to look for. And for that, we are gonna have to look hard into uh, what Jonathan already touched on, which is uh, the background rates of group A strep infection complications around the world, because different areas uh, have different rates, as I'll show you. Uh, ideally, we would love to have some biomarkers of disease severity and sequela, especially because they will be very good to signal if something was to develop uh, after a uh, vaccine immunity or the challenge of uh, that infection will represent in, in, in the face of vaccines. And, uh, and I think we need to take our clues also from a, a small but important uh, preclinical studies that have been going on uh, and how to apply the new uh, vaccine safety methods and causality assessment into the phase one and uh, phase two and phase three studies. And finally, there are some regulatory considerations that are important. So I won't go very much in detail, but this slide, which is very complicated, shows uh, what's the, what we think is the pathway uh, of how uh, streptococcal pharyngitis may lead uh, immunologically to the autoimmune phenomenon of uh, um, carditis, uh, valvulitis, and then a uh, chronic autoimmune rheumatic heart disease. And as you can see, our understanding in process is, uh, is incomplete. Uh, we do understand a bit better. We suspect that there is a, a, a lot of um, a anti a carbohydrate antibodies involved as well as T cells, and there is probably cross a reaction with the cardiac myosin, although there's a lot of questions about myosin being internalized and not necessarily be exposed to this process, and how eventually the, the valvular endothelium gets damaged, and then it leads to rheumatic heart disease. But the important thing is that uh, as much as this has been hypothesized and studied, uh, and, and there is a, a sense of what are the timelines for development uh, after an exposure, we don't fully have a, the, what, what we call in vaccine safety, the biological windows of, of how this phenomenon comes about. We do understand that after group A strep infection, 
uh, the minimum window towards the development of, of a potential rheumatic heart disease, acute rheumatic heart disease may be uh, the minimum of two weeks, but it may be more like four or six weeks. And that's based on our uh, general knowledge of uh, immunology, as well as the observations that have been carried out uh, uh, around these infections. But group strep infection is such a common infection, we, we don't have a, a substantial sort of a study into this. And these are gonna be important because if, if you end up vaccinating an individual and that individual event uh, will develop, let's say an acute carditis, the question is, is this carditis occurring in within the time window that we think it could be a causally related to um, the activation of uh, autoantibodies due to the vaccine? And uh, so in, in fact, uh, this is one of those vaccines where the complications of natural infection are also the worries uh, of vaccine safety reactions. And, and therefore, you know, the other very important thing is to sort of have those background rates and, and, and what we call we call endpoints of interest and and measuring and, and obtaining that i think jonathan has been very clear on how uh, there is this uh, important effort to sort of try to get those studies ongoing but these are the different methods that you can use to estimate those incidents and and prevalences including active surveillance systems echocardiographic screening community surveys etc and each one of them will give you a different sort of level of certainty and also of the kind of disease that you're looking for, uh, but which will be important at uh, eventual vaccine safety signals. And we know that that uh, because methods that have been used for these background rates are different, uh, we have uh, tremendously different estimates of, uh, of incidence of these sequelae around the world. This is a map uh, portraying the rheumatic heart disease and you can see that the dots express the, the incidence rates and then uh, the colors of the map express um, uh, what has been the change over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, you see countries that seem to be improving in terms of the disease incidence, some other countries that are uh, worsening and we don't know if they are getting worse because the surveillance systems are better and the detection systems are better and there are studies ongoing that gives us a better sta uh, statement of incidence. But any of these countries that are gonna uh, be involved in group strep studies and look at vaccine safety will have to have a good sense of background rates. And, and ideally, we would love to have a biomarkers of pathogenesis, a, because if, as, as Shirani said, if we had a correlate of immunity, it would be ideal if we could have a biomarker or a couple biomarkers that could be correlates of vaccine safety, meaning if they were, if an individual was vaccinated, were eventually to develop a, a, an autoimmune reaction leading to carditis, we would love to have a biomarker that we can see it expressed as before or during the study and or during that, that episode and that it compares to people that are not getting that process. And so we have listed here some of those uh, potential um, biomarkers that uh, have been looked at in terms of the pathogenesis and how they could be uh, part of those molecular postulates of uh, causality. Uh, what I think we need to um, uh, acknowledge is that um, uh, there's no well-defined immune markers that could act as that surrogate of um, acute rheumatic fever development, uh, that we have those gaps in the knowledge of mechanismic correlates of, uh, of uh, pathogenesis, and that we probably need more natural infection studies uh, that will help us understand uh, those pathways as, as, as well as the timelines and that there is the need for this development of the biological time windows that will help us understand and apply a, a issues of causality. In the meantime, John's criteria with ECHO continue to be essential for the measurement of vaccine safety as one of the potential signals, signals of interest. Uh, the preclinical studies have been crucial. Uh, this is uh, the, that famous uh, uh, one of the studies using the M-type 3 vaccine study that was done uh, by Benjamin Massel in 1965. Uh, and these are the three uh, children that developed what in that case was a, tri a tribute to be uh, secondary to the vaccine. Uh, uh, so three episodes of acute rheumatic fever. Uh, but as you can see, what I'm trying to portray in this graph is first of all, remember that these children had several uh, doses uh, of vaccination at different dose intervals, at different dose uh, uh, ranges. And uh, within the follow-up of these children also, there were several episodes of group eight strep infection that happened. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, they, they develop um, 
what was suspected to be acute rheumatic fever, some of them carditis, some of them arthritis, uh, and all of them in different time windows after the exposure. Uh, the basis for sort of saying that this may have been uh, caused by the vaccine was that at the end, they calculated an uh, attributable risk or uh, incidence rate in those that were vaccinated that were 18 siblings of other children. And that rate was 11% versus, you know, a baseline rate that they had calculated in the rest of the population that they were following that was between 0.9 and 1.1%. And that sort of meant a tenfold increase in the incidence of this. And that was sort of what led to the, the suspect that this vaccine may be a more harmful than beneficial. Uh, more recently, we have had the 30 valent M protein vaccine. I think that's this is a, the report of the phase one study. Uh, that was a two-one ratio vaccine versus an active placebo and three doses given. Um, there were 23 people vaccinated. They looked at vaccine safety they, in the traditional way that we looked in terms of local and systemic adverse events, but also they did cardiac and neurological and joint exams, including echoes uh, at day zero and day two, 2011, and they looked at tissue cross-reactive assays. And the results were that uh, uh, most, of, uh, most vaccinees and controls didn't have much difference except for more muscle ache in those that receive uh, the strep A vaccine. Uh, there were three participants that developed proteinuria, but those two were in the vaccinees, one was in the control, very much within the ratio of what the vaccine and controls were, and there were no cardiac or tissue cross-reactive antibodies. But they, this sort of is some of the studies that lead us to the basis of that vaccine safety evaluation. Our group has developed what we think is a, a, the proposed sort of safety monitoring um, uh, variables that should be followed. And so we listed them in category from common safety uh, uh, monitoring, uh, which included, you know, the traditional um, immediate and local reactions, uh, uh, daily reactogenicity, the unsolicited adverse events and SAEs, and how often they should occur. And then what we call the strep A specific assessments, which will include a non-specific inflammatory parameters like CRP, C3, C4, um, a very well-designed a group A strep culture monitoring that allows us to sort of detect a symptomatic and symptomatic infection also to ensure that there's not a, a breakthrough with a strep infection that may cause acute rheumatic fever, as well as some measures of, um, you know, strep A, a immunity, including the anti-DNAs and anti strep globalizing O, as well as anti-tissue respond, responses in heart, kidney, and myelin. And then what we call the cardiac function assessment, which will include an ECG and an echocardiogram uh, at baseline and at, uh, at least every 12 months if needed. The other important thing is the use of a, what we call or the adaptation of the World Health Organization causality assessment algorithm uh, that has been well developed for a, a, a adverse events uh, following immunization. And they use this algorithm that includes sort of looking for other potential alternative causes that explain the adverse event. Uh, so uh, sort of looking at the time windows, and, and that's why the time windows that I was discussing before are so important. And then uh, the evidence that we have, and we have uh, been accumulated in terms of something that can refute or accept the issue that this vaccine may be related to the adverse event that we're thinking. So at the end of the day, we will need certain parameters that are important. We will need those background rates uh, of possible safety signals, including the incidence and prevalence of acute rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease and of chronic kidney disease, for example. We probably need to uh, develop additional case definitions, not, not only what we have in terms of Jones criteria, but do we need a more stricter case definition for acute rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease, probably using the Brighton Collaboration Consensus Guidelines uh, with severity and certainty. Um, we probably need to look into what kind of safety assessment methods are we going to use from a, a self-control case series method to perhaps immune profiling of cases and controls and minimum incidence rate. Finally, what I've already mentioned, the guidelines uh, and adaptation of causality assessment of SUSARs and ASS, uh, which will be crucial for that process, including its laboratory parameters. Um, 
just to finalize, uh, these adverse events of special interest are going to be important in terms of product-specific mechanism of action uh, of the platforms and vaccine compositions that we're going to be looking at in the clinical trials. And we probably need to accumulate um, uh, some uh, safety experience, including what, what are the different group A strep-related disease manifestations uh, during the trial. Uh, the trials will need to detect all new onset group A strep infections that could result in acute rheumatic fever. And probably they will need to consider some way of uh, giving antibiotic treatment to prevent the development of acute rheumatic fever as a standard sort of not to uh, introduce confounding into the process of safety. And, uh, and we will probably need a long-term follow-up of the vaccine participants that may include our traditional 12 to 24 months, but more than that, some of these diseases may develop in the future as immunity wanes. And so I want to acknowledge the Welcome Trust, uh, the SAVAC Executive Committee, uh, and working groups, and the, uh, my collaborators, and, and the group that really work hard on that process. And uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Edwin. Um, <clears throat> great to see that overview of the thinking around um, safety assessments in relation to routine assessments, but then also specific assessments uh, taking in consideration some of the uh, the issues around um, strep A and rheumatic fever. So um, we've had a few questions in the chat and once again, you're welcome to raise your hand um, and I can go to you. Um, but I might start by, there's also been some, some questions in the chat as well. Um, so I might just start with the first question to um, Jonathan Karapetis, which is how does the burden of strep A compare to other major vaccine preventable diseases? Jonathan. So um, it's, it may be surprising to you that strep A, um, based on the data that we can pull together, and this is a relatively conservative assumption, appears to be the fifth most lethal pathogen on the planet. Um, and that's when you look at the number of deaths per year, which are easily 500,000 per year, possibly more due to rheumatic heart disease, invasive disease would be the two big killers, um, but there are a number of others. Um, and so that really falls behind HIV, TB, TB malaria and pneumococcus. Um, so there's no doubt that the burden in terms of mortality um, is very significant in terms of DALIs. It hasn't really been fully quantified for all strep A diseases. It's been quantified for rheumatic heart disease, uh, over 10 million. Uh, but, the, um, but that's a piece of work that we are hoping to, to undertake. Thanks, Jonathan. <clears throat> I think it is important to, to frame strep A in terms of uh, other infectious diseases as you've done there. Um, the next question is to Sharani. Um, so, Sharani, there's been a couple of questions in the chat now around um, assays. So, I might just try and smush, smush those together. Um, so, one is from um, Anna Norby Tegland, which is around functional assays are important. Upsonic is are good as they measure outcomes, while inhibitory assays are often factor specific. Um, how does the discussion go there? And, and also a question, an earlier question um, around the role of multiplex ELISA as an assay system. So it's obviously some, some two big questions there, but if you could respond, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, so um, hi, Anna. Uh, I guess the, I mean, I, I'm with you on this because having worked mechanistically on the pathogenesis of group A strep for so long, it's very hard to let go of those assays that we know are completely relevant to pathogenesis. So I think opsonophagocytosis is a key part of immunity, but it isn't the only part because I, I don't understand why we get so many children who carry and shed so much group A strep but never get symptomatic pharyngitis. And that to me says that inhibition of virulence must be important and um, also that some children never get colonized at all. And therefore, um, maybe there are immune factors to, related to the colonization event that have nothing to do with phagocytosis. So I wouldn't say that I would ignore phagocytosis. It's more that um, the people who know far more than I do about vaccine development tell me that it would be nigh on impossible to introduce that sort of assay that we're all familiar with and that, you know, that has amazingly been been um, rolled out to HL60 cells, it just would not be practical on a large scale to use that in a vaccine. So that's why you need these other assays, which 
But I still think that those other assays, whether they be multiplex ELISA or, or bead assays, at some point need to be cross-validated uh, so that the community is confident that they do bear some relevance to the immunity that we understand, the mechanistic immunity. And then the question about multiplex ELISA is, yeah, absolutely. I, I think an ELISA-based assay would be fine, a bead-based assay would be fine. And I think it's just something that would work and would be, is tractable across uh, a lot of places. And that's why beads and some of these um, MSD type assays are quite are quite tractable in that respect. And Sharani, just to extend that, um, that question, just with a, a new question here in the chat from Jill Gilmore, is there a role or what is the role, I guess, for the you know, emerging systems biology approach to identify immune signatures? What, what sort of work should we be thinking about doing there to ex extend um, our understanding? Well, I think whatever method you use, you have to be confident that the model you've used is immune. I mean, I think one of the problems I've found in the past is that people have kind of looked at, you know, groups of children or somebody who, who've either had, um, for example, tick disorders or something and, and said, well, they must be immune because they must have had group A strep. So that's kind of quite several steps beyond beyond what you might might say is, is reasonable. So, you know, either you want to look at somebody who's definitely had a confirmed group A strep sore throat and then you follow them religiously, either one person or like I showed you in the classroom, lots of children with the same infection. Uh, and I think those would be good models to follow. And of course, the human challenge model that you're, you're studying, Andrew, really opens itself up to doing some really amazing reverse immunology. The problem is it's in adults who are probably pre-exposed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <clears throat> no, thanks very much, Sharani. That's a great answer to that question. Um, I might now switch to Edwin. Um, so, Edwin, there's a, a, a question that's come in um, from, and unfortunately not everybody can, can see it, so I'll just read it out from David Caslow. So, Edwin, in addition to biomarkers that might detect activation of pathways associated with naturally acquired strep A pathology, any thoughts on detection of vaccine associated enhanced disease not related to naturally acquired um, infection? And I think David's thinking about, you know, atypical vaccine related events with RSV, killed measles vaccine and so yeah. on. Um, is that oh, something? And, and, yeah, yeah and, and they well describe, you know, ADE for influenza and uh, and dengue, which I think uh, dengue for me is one of those vaccines that may, may we, we may borrow some of uh, what has been happening in terms of safety evaluation, right? So, so uh, AD is a sort of thought as a primary sin, where basically your um, your initial for response to the vaccine or the infection is incomplete, or uh, or at least the the first infection or the first vaccination is not as a a, as, as a comprehensive in terms of eliciting the, the broad neutralizing antibodies that you need and therefore you leave a, just part of, part of that protection and then when that wanes, a, a second exposure may enhance the process of, a, of internalization and sort of a, a develop a more infl inflammatory reaction. And I think that that is a worry with any vaccine. If you look at animal models, you probably can elicit ADE in almost any model, uh, as long as you sort of uh, play with the immunity. I think humans are a little bit more complex than that. And, uh, and yes, a, a ADE is one of those worries that we uh, keep an eye on it. Uh, I think it, it, it will depend a lot on, on what kind of uh, immunity uh, the group A strep vaccines that are under development will develop. Um, we suspect that we have a good sense of what they correlate or what the targets of the protection are for group A strep. Um, and, but I think the important thing here is understanding how acute rheumatic fever and carditis and the injury develops uh, will be crucial. Uh, for now, it seems like a, there's a lot of cross-reactivity of antibodies that sort of lead to this and it's not necessarily the issue of immune enhancement after this process, but I think measurements of uh, immune enhancement are going to be a uh, part of those uh, sort of studies that probably one will like to explore in this, in this, um, in these trials. Yeah, but I might just um, push you a little bit more on, um, not so much on this enhanced question, but more around the, um, 
the need and the, the frequency, and I guess speaking to Julie Skinner's question, the duration of um, assessment for safety, because I think that there's a real balance that needs to be struck um, between, um, uh, you know, good safety um, measures that provide um, reassurance and assurance to the community and participants versus um, safety assessments that may just become too burdensome and potentially too expensive. So um, Jonathan asked a question um, in the chat around the risk of doing too many sequential echoes in clinical trials, um, particularly because there may be subtle changes that may not be of significance, which could raise concerns and also because of the difficulties of interpreting echocardiograms and their expense. Um, so could you maybe speak to some of these aspects around echocardiography about doing lots of echoes and also the duration of follow-up? Yeah, I think that that's a fantastic question because, uh, uh, but I think we can probably uh, import some of our uh, thoughts of what has happened in other studies, like for example, the, the famous standardization of, of uh, WHO criteria for pneumonia in the pneumococcal trials that were done as, as well as the hemophilus influenza trials. I think we're gonna need to standardize the way that we look at echo uh, for these uh, diseases to sort of get a, a good sense of what, what we are measuring, what measure is. We do have a sense that that can be done. I mean, it has been done for Kawasaki disease for sure, where basically we have standardized now the way to look at this and, and different uh, interpreters or observers can sort of look at the echo and sort of come up with a, a way of interpreting the echo in a way that, that could be more consistent. Uh, but I, I do think that it, because we don't have a, this systematic sort of look at echo after group based strep infection, as part of the natural infection, or there are a few studies that perhaps not at the level that we would like it, um, uh, then we, 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 we are departing within these trials without that complete knowledge, right? And in a sense, we're almost gonna have to do it as we're doing this, the, the studies. The great advantage of that could be that also you're looking at controls and vaccinees, and therefore you will have a, 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 a prospective comparison of, of those two uh, to look at what echo represents. Uh, I think if we had a better sense of what a, an echo, a, a periodic echo was in a group A strep infection leading to acute rheumatic fever, of course that will be a challenge looking at you know, thousands and thousands of children. Um, um, you know, we will probably have a better way of sort of saying how often we should do it for vaccine safety. But uh, as we don't have that data, I think we're gonna to have to go with our best uh, estimate of perhaps at least a yearly echo in, this, in these children. And, uh, and meaning that probably one will like to lead it up to five years just to see what it, did, what it, what it happens, right? I mean, if, unless uh, we had a better sense of, uh, of uh, that, that there should be a shorter time interval to look at them. Yeah, thanks, Evan. I think as part of the, that's a great answer. I think as part of the safety group, you know, thinking about these questions and getting, um, you know, information and, and, and viewpoints from multiple experts would be really important. So we've come up to the hour. I'm gonna just steal one minute from, from David Bloom for this last, for the next session, just for one last question, which is kind of the million dollar question, which is to Sharani. Um, so this Sharani, this question's from Mark Walker. Um, how can we separate identity of protective immunity antigens versus autoimmune triggers in humans? Do we know the identity of either? So. I it does feel like this is the uh, um, the the, goal, the the million dollar question, but if you could have a have a go at answering that, would be terrific. Well, I kind of think we should turn it back on Mark Walker, really, because uh, <laughs> to send that in on the hour is a bit unfair. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I I I don't know. I, I really don't know, and I think that um, that's why looking in in the in the pharynx would be great because I think you know. I don't think anyone believes that a mucosal immune response in the, in the mouth is necessarily going to result in rheumatic heart disease and rheumatic fever is a more systemic illness. So maybe if we focus on the mucosal immunity a little bit more than we have done in the last 100 years, we might, we might find out what's important actually to prevent sore throat. And that's the only kind of easy answer I've got. Mark, do you have a, is he allowed to talk? Has he got inside? He may have an idea. Maybe he knows. <laughs> 
I was just going to say it's, that was a terrific way to finish. I can't see. Okay, I won't. He can answer, he can answer in the chat. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds great. That's Thank a, you. a great way to finish. So I'll now hand over to um, uh, to David Bloom, who's going to chair the next session. David's a member of our executive committee, a very active member, and he's going to be chairing the next uh, one-hour session, which is on um, the uh, full value of vaccines. Over to you, David. Um, thank you, Andrew. And Chloe, if I can just ask you to pull up the slides and uh, it, should, it should be on the cover slide now. Thank you. Uh, good day to all colleagues and participants. Uh, I'm happy to have this time together in our little corner of cyberspace. Uh, for the next 15 minutes or so, my objective is to brief you on one of SAVEC's key work streams uh, namely the full value of vaccines assessment, which goes internally by the acronym FVVA. Uh, but before I get to FVVA, I did want to express my view that SAVAC is an extremely worthwhile project. And I want to say that I'm very pleased to be a part of it. Uh, my pleasure here is grounded in research I've read or been involved in conducting for nearly two decades now. Uh, research that indicates that vaccination has been substantially undervalued. Uh, it's been undervalued because academics and policymakers alike have generally failed to recognize and take proper account of the full health, economic, and social benefits that vaccination confers. And that blind spot uh, has led to underinvestment in both vaccine development and vaccination coverage. Uh, and such underinvestment, I would say, has been very much to the peril of populations throughout the world. Uh, but especially to the peril of people living in low and middle income countries. Now, these views about undervaluation and underinvestment are general in nature. They apply to many pairs of pathogens and corresponding available or prospective vaccines. But for our purposes, what's most important is that they may well apply uh, and with force to vaccination against strep A infection. Uh, as we all know and have just heard, uh, strep A affects people across the entire age spectrum and manifests in a multiplicity of clinical endpoints that range from pharyngitis, impetigo, and cellulitis to maternal sepsis, toxic shock syndrome, and rheumatic heart disease. Um, I see the work of SAVEC as an appropriately ambitious attempt to address the non-existence of vaccines for strep A infection, which is a situation that permits inequities within countries, across countries, and is plausibly suboptimal as well. Reforming the health ecosystem so that vaccinations are in general properly valued and appropriately utilized will ultimately involve everything from rationalization and reform of institutions and practices for vaccine regulation to advances in the way we conceptualize and operationalize health technology assessment to increasing investments, obviously, in vaccine development, testing, and delivery. These are complex tasks that require a wide range of expertise and experience, and also they're blending with some serious political and financial muscle. But there's a big pot of gold awaiting the world at the end of the vaccination rainbow, I'm convinced. And I'm excited at the prospect of having an opportunity to help the world find the strep A portion of that pot, if it's indeed there. Uh, Chloe, if I can just ask you to switch to the next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to turn now to a short briefing on the SAVAC work stream that involves the FEVA or the full value of vaccines assessment. Achieving the goals of this work stream requires that one be explicit and well aligned with respect to three sets of issues that are fundamental to undertaking meaningful assessments of value. The first set of issues has to do with perspective. The second set of issues has to do with sources of value. And the third set of issues has to do with metrics. Perspective refers to the stakeholder or stakeholders whose interests we're using to assess value. For example, are we looking through the eyes of vaccine developers, manufacturers, and distributors, through the eyes of health ministers or finance ministers, through the eyes of vaccine recipients and their families, uh, perhaps through the eyes of employers, public and private donors, or are we looking through the eyes of society as a whole? Sources of value refer to the dominant interest associated with each perspective. For vaccine manufacturers, value naturally includes the risk-adjusted surplus of revenue above cost. 
one manifestation of which is profit. For health ministers, value includes population health and healthcare spending. For finance and planning ministers, it includes public revenues and expenditures and the distribution of economic well being. For individuals and their families, it includes the inherent and the instrumental values of better health. And for society as a whole, it would include most of the benefits I've already noted, net of the value associated with any opportunities foregone due to spending on strep A vaccine development and on vaccination. Uh, it would also, for society as a whole, include the value assigned to any changes in social equity and possibly political stability that may be associated with falls in the incidence and severity of vaccine preventable diseases. Finally, uh, we have metrics, uh, metrics which we use to measure value and set priorities among alternative uses of funds and which absolutely need to have a clear and logical connection to the elements of perspective and sources of value. For vaccine manufacturers, a key metric is the commercial return on investment. For health ministers, a primary metric is incremental cost effectiveness. For finance ministers, metrics include fiscal balance and macroeconomic performance and perhaps poverty reduction as well. And for society as a whole, a natural metric is a social benefit cost ratio that is reflective of a broad range of health, economic and social benefits attributable to spending on vaccine development and delivery. Uh, there are well-established methods and data requirements for calculating a commercial rate of return, for calculating an incremental cost effectiveness ratio, and for calculating a social benefit cost ratio. The key point I'm trying to make here is that each answers a different question. Commercial rates of return are relevant for private investment decisions, uh, and they're the bread and butter of corporate investment analysts. Cost effectiveness ratios are relevant to allocating a health budget in the interests of maximizing population health, and they're the workhorse of standard health technology assessments. And social benefit cost ratios are relevant to maximizing societal welfare, which involves determining both the size of a health budget and also its allocation among different programs and interventions. The field of health technology assessment has long given short shrift to the full societal benefits of health interventions, but that problem is now being actively redressed the world over with a huge boost coming from what the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to learn about the health, economic and social burdens of infectious diseases and the corresponding benefits of preventive vaccines. As uh, the next slide, please. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, as a core part of SAVAC, um, these interrelated aspects of perspective, value, and metrics are being applied to prospective strep A vaccines. In particular, SAVAC is developing a comprehensive, quantified view of the value of strep A vaccines through the conduct and consideration of four sets of analyses. The first set of analyses is focused on the burdens of strep A disease and it overlaps with and is being informed by the burden of disease work Jonathan described earlier. Our work here includes systematic reviews of literature being undertaken by Jeff Cannon and Kate Miller at Telethon Kids Institute. These reviews are aimed at, especially at helping us take stock of existing work that seeks to conceptualize, model, and measure the consequences of strep A infection for population health in different epidemiological, social, economic, and health system contexts. The second set of analyses is focused on the business investment case. These analyses are being led by Marnie Williams and Don Walkinshaw at Shift Health, and both Don and Marnie will report on their work later in this session. The third set of analyses focuses on the traditional health-centric, health-payer-centric investment case. These analyses are being led by Vital Mogasal and Jun Suk Lee at IVI. And the fourth set of analyses focuses on the global investment case, which Dan Cataret, Jeff Cannon, and I are working on at the Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health. This set of analyses looks at the sources of and returns on investment in a strep A vaccine from a societal perspective and seeks to capture as many of the health, economic, and social benefits of a strep A vaccine as possible. Insofar as public monies would likely be substantially used to finance strep A vaccination coverage, it makes sense to know and compare those public costs with the corresponding value of the full public benefits that may be expected to follow from them. 
Uh, the next slide, please, Chloe. This table that you see on the screen details categories related to the potential value created by the development and delivery of a strep A vaccine. The categories specified generally vary in their relevance to the different valuation exercises. They also vary in terms of the availability of data to meaningfully quantify them. In the absence of data, we can sometimes rely on models calibrated using parameters in existing literature, along with related sensitivity analyses to reflect uncertainty. In other situations, we can merely note a source of value and reason our way to an inference as to whether its indeterminate magnitude likely makes the quantitative results more or less conservative. The FEVA has been in operation for a little more than a year. It's no surprise that we've benefited a lot from the generous and constructive guidance received from members of SAVAC's Distinguished Executive Committee. We've also benefited from a world-class technical advisory committee uh, that's made up of epidemiologists, health economists, and specialists in medicine, immunology, and global health policy. In addition to working on the construction of our various valuation frameworks, as I've outlined them thus far, we've also spent a considerable portion of the past year building or trying to build a solid foundation for the full body of work we aspire to do. And let me just briefly mention three activities here. Uh, the next slide, please, Chloe. Um, activity one, now we're taking stock through a series of four systematic reviews, one of which I've already mentioned, uh, taking stock of existing data and literature on the incidence of strep A clinical endpoints throughout the world and over time, along with their social, economic, and spatial correlates. Our hope is to publish these systematic reviews in academic journals to elicit the benefits of peer review and to save others the time it takes to gather, review, and distill the messages from what is a sizable and dispersed body of literature. For FVVA, Jeff Cannon is leading the conduct of these systematic reviews, and Jeff is on hand in case anyone wants to hear more about them in the Q&A portion of this session. Uh, next slide, please, Chloe. Uh, Jeff Cannon has also been working at a collaboration with Julie Bennett and Michael Baker at New Zealand's University of Otago. The collaboration focuses on our reliance on antibiotics, our current reliance on antibiotics to address strep A infection. Uh, but in, in this case, with attention to the effect on the microbiome at the individual level and on antibiotic resistance among bystander pathogens at the community level. Uh, next slide, please, Chloe. Activity three. Um, I'm happy to report that we've recruited Kaja Abbas to work with us on the development of a general static epidemiological model of strep A clinical endpoints. Kaja, as some of you may know, is a very talented and enthusiastic modeler at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Our hope is to use appropriately calibrated versions of the resulting EPI model to anchor our cost effectiveness and social return on investment analyses. We also hope to work with Kaja on the development of a dynamic disease transmission model to incorporate the indirect effects of strep A vaccination on infection and clinical endpoints. Both the static and the dynamic epidemiological models will be made as user-friendly as possible to facilitate use by external stakeholders. Um, and then the final slide, Chloe, please. Um, and just to close, I would say that um, as everyone has experienced, the past year has been very challenging for all of us. Um, but having said that, the FVVA team continues to move forward at an accelerating pace toward delivering to you and others a set of theoretically sound, quantified analyses pertinent to the development and delivery of prospective strep A vaccines. And just to reiterate, um, uh, what we're planning to deliver will take shape in a business investment case, a traditional health technology assessment, and a societal investment case. I'm now going to turn the floor over to my colleagues at Shift Health, who've been leading SAVAX research on the business investment case for the development of strep A vaccines. Um, as you're about to hear, uh, they've done considerable work, uh, which is most definitely informing and inspiring the rest of the FEVA efforts. Um, we're going to hear from uh, first from Don Walkinshaw on the state of the strep A vaccine pipeline, and then we'll shift gears and, uh, no pun intended, and uh, switch to Marnie Williams, who'll brief us on Shift Health's further work on the business investment case. 
So um, Don, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, I just wanna make sure that my slide is properly visible. Excellent. Yes, yes it is. Uh, thanks so much, David. Um, so my team, as David said, is working on the business case right now for a strep A vaccine and my colleague Marty Williams will give an update on that in the next talk. Um, in preparation for the business case work, we conducted a vaccine pipeline assessment last year, and the slides I'll walk you through now draw on that work, as well as recent updates from some of the developers, um, many of whom are attending the meeting today. Overall, the vaccine pipeline is early stage, and no current program uh, has yet entered phase two, and most of them are yet to enter phase one. Um, the pipeline is also growing. Uh, of late. Now there are at least eight active programs with a strong product development focus. And these programs test a diverse uh, range of concepts and antigens, uh, which you'll see in a moment. The eight programs that I'll talk about today come from around the world uh, and developers in both industry and academia. And they can be bucketed uh, broadly into uh, M protein vaccines and non M protein vaccines. And I'll uh, do one slide on each of those showing the four uh, candidates that fit into each of those two buckets. Uh, for the M protein vaccines, we have Streptonova uh, from Jim Dale's lab at the University of Tennessee and Vaxent, Streptincor from Luisa Galerme's group at the University of Sao Paulo, and both MJ8 Combivax and PSTAR17 from uh, Michael Goods group at Griffith University and collaborators. Um, all of these contain uh, recombinant uh, proteins, uh, recombinant peptides from M proteins, although you'll see there are some differences uh, in, in terms of um, which ones specifically and what they're paired with in the vaccines. Uh, Streptonova is the farthest along in development, having recently completed a phase 1A trial that showed uh, no autoimmunity uh, or cross-reactive antibodies, uh, and also significant immunogenicity against most of the targeted uh, antigens. Uh, Streptincor, uh, which is comprised of an, an M5 a protein peptide with B and T cell epitopes, um, has experienced a delay in getting its planned phase one trial started, but it's building on uh, promising animal studies suggesting no harmful effects uh, on heart tissue and immunogenicity and protection against strep A challenge in mice. The, the two on the right side are similar candidates. They both have two peptides conjugated to a carrier protein. Um, one of those peptides is the same in, in both candidates. Uh, it's a um, B cell epitope, modified B cell epitope from the interleukin-8 protease SPICEP. Um, and then they each have a C-terminal M protein peptide, uh, J8, uh, in, in the case of the one on the left, and PSTAR17, uh, which is a, a variation in the one on the right. Uh, and they, they've both shown promising activity in preclinical models um, of note, PSTAR17 uh, was shown for PSTAR17 in a recent publication that intramuscular injections plus an intranasal dose uh, induced high antibodies in both the airway mucosa uh, and in serum, uh, and it protected against upper respiratory tract uh, infection and invasive disease in mice. Uh, both of these candidates will be entering a phase one dose ranging study in Canada this year. And if successful, PSTAR 17 uh, would then uh, be ready to go into a phase one B human challenge study um, uh, later on. Now we have the non M protein vaccines. Um, I'll talk about the first two first because uh, they have some similarities. Combo 4 from GSK GVGH uh, and VAXA1 from uh, Vaxite, uh, which is based on work from Victor Nizay's lab at uh, UC San Diego. Both of these uh, contain recombinant proteins as well as group A carbohydrate, uh, although they're slightly different versions of the group A carbohydrate. Um, GVGH's vaccine also contains uh, three proteins, um, and you'll recognize a lot of these antigens from the earlier talks uh, from, uh, from Shirani, um, uh, particularly uh, streptolysin O, SPICEP, and SPI AD. Uh, Vaxite has not disclosed its final uh, components, but they did have a recent uh, publication that looked at a formulation with streptolysin O, SPI AD, and C5A uh, peptidase. 
Um, both of these are building on favorable preclinical work uh, showing uh, safety results uh, and in immunogenicity in non-human primates uh, in the case of, of the GVGH candidate uh, and protection against uh, challenge uh, in, in terms of both skin infection and systemic um, in, in mice in, in terms of the Vaxite candidate. Um, next is Combo 5 from Mark Walker's group at the University of Queensland. Uh, so that contains uh, five recombinant proteins, some of which overlap uh, with ones in the other candidates, uh, Streptolysin O, Spicep, uh, and uh, SPC, uh, sorry, SCPA or, or C5A peptidase, as well as trigger factor and arginine DMNAs. Um, this candidate reduced pharyngitis uh, in non-human primates and protected against skin infection and invasive infection in mice. That program is planning additional NHP studies as well as controlled human challenge studies. Uh, and then we have TVAX uh, from the University of Auckland, uh, from uh, Thomas Proft, Jocelyn Lowe, uh, Nikki Moreland and colleagues. This one is a multivalent protein vaccine with T antigen domains from the pilus of the majority of strep A strains. Uh, it's shown some protective efficacy against invasive disease in mice. Um, they're currently working on reformulation, uh, looking at different antigens, um, as well as assessing mucosal delivery. So I've sped through those eight candidates, but in summary, the pipeline is poised to test human proof of concept for a variety of strategies and antigen types over the next few years. Uh, funding is a barrier for some of these programs pointing to the need for continued advocacy and awareness building uh, around uh, the need uh, and the market potential for strep A uh, vaccines. Uh, and I'd just like to thank uh, the SAVAC uh, uh, Executive Committee, the, the FEVA Working Group, IVI, the Wellcome Trust, my team, uh, as well as the interviewees listed in the table here, uh, including representatives from uh, all eight of the programs uh, that I just talked about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don. Um, now, if we can, uh, Chloe, load up, or Marnie can load up her slides and we'll turn to her presentation on the business investment case. Great, uh, thank you, David. Um, so my name is Marnie Williams and I will be presenting some preliminary results from the business case of a strep A vaccine. And this work has been conducted by Shift Health in close col collaboration with SAVAC. So the objective of this business case is to provide manufacturers with key information to support their decision-making uh, on the development and manufacturing of a new strep A vaccine. This business case is based on the outputs of a dynamic forecasting model that we developed for a hypothetical strep A vaccine using transparent evidence-based assumptions and inputs to demonstrate the potential demand, revenue, profits, and return on investment for such a vaccine. In the larger context of the ABVA, as David mentioned, this business case will provide a sense of the potential commercial opportunity of a strep A vaccine and thereby complement other efforts of the ABVA working group that is focused on assessing the health, economic and social burden of strep A. A few key characteristics of our model. First of all, uh, we had to assume that the, that the strep A vaccine will be successful in that it will meet all of the requirements uh, set forth by the WHO preferred product characteristics that it will achieve licensure and pre-qualification, and that it will be adopted by all of the countries that we included in our database for the model. This model provides an estimate of the global demand for the vaccine, but the results can also be segmented by region, by country income level group um, on a per country basis, as well as by either public or private healthcare market. In the absence of clinical and real world data for a strep A vaccine, we used recent country level data from relevant proxy vaccines uh, that were all validated by a stakeholder interviews. And this included proxy vaccines such as DTP, pneumococcal, rotavirus, and HIP. There are some uncertainties, particularly around the timelines for development and the timeline for vaccine adoption by the various countries, as well as the time that it will take for the countries to reach maximal uh, uh, coverage rates, and we therefore uh, show modeling results across three different scenarios, a conservative, a realistic, and an optimistic scenarios, where we adjusted the various timelines. 
And then lastly, this model that we developed is dynamic in that it allows for all inputs and assumptions to be modified, especially as new data for this vaccine becomes available. Unfortunately, I will not have time to go through all of the um, specifics of our model assumptions and inputs, but I invite you to look at the presentation that was shared prior to this meeting if you want to look at some of these uh, details that we used. But I want to spend a little bit of time talking through our model schematic to show you uh, what are some of the modifications that we made. First of all, in terms of the timeline for R&D development, we used both an accelerated as well as a traditional timeline. Under the accelerated timeline, this was um, to some extent ins inspired by what we are seeing currently with the COVID vaccine development, where we are assuming a more contracted um, development timeline of eight years, starting in phase one in 2021 and market launch in 2029. We also then assumed a more traditional timeline for development um, of 13 years for launch in 2034. The time that it will take for all of the countries to adopt the vaccine in our database was assumed to be either eight years under a more optimistic scenario versus 15 and 20 years under the traditional timeline. And this reflects what we have been observing for uh, historical vaccines in terms of how long it's been taking countries uh, to, to adopt um, vaccines. In terms of the target population, we looked at two different cohorts. First of all, an infant cohort where the um, infants younger than uh, 12 months would be vaccinated and also a child immunization program where the vaccine would be given to children between the ages of four, of four and seven. Depending on this cohort, we also use different uh, proxy vaccines to provide us with a sense of the maximum coverage rates that could be achieved through either cohort. For the infant program, we use the third dose of DTP. And for the child program, we use the second dose of MCV, which is a vaccine that in many countries uh, is given to children between the ages of four and seven. And then we also adjusted the ramp up periods um, to reaching that, optim that maximum coverage rate. And we changed that to be either five, 10 or 15 years. And this is all again, based on what we have been observing um, for historical vaccines. In order to calculate the potential return on investment, we also looked at two different scenarios. The first scenario is where a multinational pharmaceutical company would be investing in the R&D of the vaccine for global rollout of a strep A vaccine, or a developing country vaccine manufacturer that would only invest in R&D development in a subset of countries uh, for rollout in only LMICs. And then in terms of the R&D investment, um, we also adjusted this to be at three different levels, depending on when the pharmaceutical company would be entering the development phase, starting from phase one, which would cover the full investment uh, for, for R&D development, or entering after phase two clinical trials have been completed, or after phase three. So that would be uh, starting from tech transfer agreements. In terms of the three scenarios that I mentioned, uh, we looked at an optimistic, realistic, and conservative scenario, and we essentially adjusted the timelines for R&D adoption and ramp up um, to be more aggressive under the optimistic scenario and more extended for the realistic and conservative scenarios. And now so for some preliminary results. First of all, in terms of the annual doses by the two different cohorts that we included in the model uh, for the realistic scenario. So we see for the for the infant program shown in green, that at peak, which is around um, after 15 years of market entry, we see that there will be a demand, an estimated demand at least of 330 million doses per year for the vaccine. And this translates into 100 million vaccinated individuals uh, with our three dose regimen. This demand drops to 220 million doses per year for our child immunization program which is as expected since the coverage rates is typically lower when you start to immunize older individuals. In this case, early school age going children. For annual doses by country income level, um, again, for the realistic scenario with the infant cohort on the left and the child immunization cohort on the right, we see that LMIC shown in sort of a lighter blue here represents about 50% of the annual doses in terms of demand for this vaccine, 
We also see this for other vaccines with LMICs are typically the highest driver of demand, um, which is as a result of the higher population sizes um, that comprise LMIC countries. We also know that there is a higher uh, relative burden of strep A diseases in LMICs, which is why we see higher earlier uptake of, of LMICs for the vaccine, which is something that we included as part of our model. In terms of annual revenue uh, and profit by market segment, as I mentioned earlier, we looked at both public and private markets. And the assumption is that via the public market, you would start to get implementation of the vaccine at an earlier stage, shown in green. Um, and this is because the private market typically absorb earlier uh, adoption of vaccines. And, and it takes longer for countries to start imp to implement the vaccine through their public national health, uh, immunization programs, which is shown in blue. So after five years for the infant program and after six years for the child immunization program, for our model at least, we see that the public market starts taking the majority share. Importantly, um, at, at peak, we estimate sales of $2.9 billion for the infant program and $2 billion per year for our child program at peak. And then, as I mentioned, we also looked at different scenarios. So all of the results that I've shown to, up until now has been for the realistic scenario. But if we compare it for the optimistic or more aggressive scenario and the conservative scenario shown in lighter blue, um, by adjusting the timelines, we see that for the optimistic scenario, you see a peak reaching uh, that's being reached earlier compared to a more slower gradual uptake in terms of uh, annual demand and revenue for the conservative or more pessimistic scenario, but all three scenarios ultimately reach the same peak. And we see a similar result for the child program at the bottom here. And then lastly, in terms of the return on investment, we calculated the NPVs um, shown here for the realistic and infant cohort program, but we did repeat all of this analysis for the other scenarios as well as for the child immunization program as well. As I mentioned, we then also looked at two scenarios where we have a multinational company investing in the rollout of the vaccine globally, or a DCVM investing in more regional or LMIC rollout of the vaccine, um, translating into lower uh, R&D investment requirements for such a DCVM. And then we also looked at three different uh, investment levels. So full development um, required at the top, the top row, um, going down to lower investment requirements if the company enters the development stage after phase three clinical trials. And what we see is that after 10 years of sales for such, such a vaccine, the NPV would be at $1.3 billion for our multinational company and $36 million for our DCVM based on current assumptions. And this would, of course, increase as the level of investment is decreased um, if the company decides to enter later on in the process. And then very quickly, in conclusion, our dynamic demand forecasting model was developed to demonstrate the total global demand of a strep A vaccine. The results are provided across three different scenarios, but these assumptions and inputs can be modified. Across all of the scenarios that we used, we see that there is a positive uh, NPV, meaning a, a good business opportunity for this vaccine. And then lastly, in combination with other outputs of the ABVA, this business case will help to create awareness around both the public health urgency of the strep A vaccine, but also represents a good business opportunity for such a vaccine. I want to thank um, the different groups at SAVAC. Uh, we look forward to continuing our collaboration with you as we finalize this business case. I would also like to thank uh, the Wellcome Trust for funding, my colleagues at Shift Health, and very importantly, all of the stakeholders that contributed time to speak to us and to help to inform the, um, the inputs and the assumptions that we used as part of this business case. Thank you. Arnie, thank you very much for that. Um, that was really um, a beautiful presentation and uh, with a lot of clarity on the structure, the assumptions and the preliminary results for the business investment case. I think we all appreciate it. Um, uh, we have some questions uh, have already come in. Um, 
And Chloe, I think you were going to try to see if we could get uh, Julia Lynch to ask her question live. Is that, have you managed to organize that? David, this is Jerome. Perhaps you can just, you can, uh, it's kind of long question, I guess. I, I, I'm happy to re read it um, uh, and it'll give Marnie a chance to think about the answer. Um, so why, why don't I do that? Um, so um, Julia um, asked Marnie, in your model, the vaccine characteristics you chose derived from PPC led to the conclusion that there is potential for a commercially viable vaccine of public health value. Sometimes a PPC is general, idealized and may not be fully realistic. Although each developer likely has a more specific target product profile in mind, it might be helpful for this group to put forward a general TPP that would guide toward a useful and feasible product with thresholds for each key characteristic. In particular, I'm wondering if the dynamic model can be used to define some of the threshold boundaries, such as a minimum level of efficacy and maximum cost of goods sold that would still result in a vaccine of public health value and commercial viability for a manufacturer. This would be very helpful in attracting a commercial partner and guide decision-making around trade-offs often required through development. Uh, Marnie, if, if, if the question is clear, perhaps you could just begin to comment by way of an answer. Of course. Uh, thank you, Julia for, Julia, for the question. Uh, you are right that at this stage, we had to take assumptions in terms of the different characteristics and, and clinical uh, endpoints for such a vaccine. And because that's not yet available, we assumed that our vaccine would be meeting the PPCs that, that are currently available. Um, at this stage, we we did assume the, the, the vaccine efficacy to be at 80%, which is the WHO requirement at this stage. But when we want to begin to change how the level of efficacy will change the level of uptake by the different countries, that will require additional work as we would have to go back to test some of, some of those assumptions with the different NITAGs in the countries to ask them, you know, at different levels of efficacy threshold, what is your likelihood of implementing such a vaccine? So that's definitely something that we could uh, do as part of future work. In terms of your maximum COGS, so what we used in, um, for our model at least is based on to the extent possible that we could find um, the, the cost per dose of a vaccine. This is often inf information that's very difficult to find as it is proprietary information. But we did test our COGS um, with some of our DCVMs that we spoke to to uh, get a sense of what um, the, the, their potential costs are when they are thinking about a vaccine that is um, similar in complexity um, that we are thinking for a strep A vaccine. Again, um, something that we did look at to sort of test our COGS assumptions is that we looked at the profit margins that we used, that we calculated. So we used um, currently um, the prices of PCV vaccine as a proxy vaccine by different income level groups that we could get from the WHO database. And then based on the COGS that we used, we looked at the different profit margins by country income level, and we tested those profit margins again with our stakeholders. And um, there were no, no um, alarms um, based on the values that we shared. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question or if there's anyone else that wants to chime in here. 
I, I can just add something quick, Marnie. A part of Julia's question, I think, gets at the need to do public health impact modeling to see what the actual impact of the vaccine might be at different efficacy levels. And that work um, has not uh, been started yet. It could be a, a future a work stream for SAVAC potentially. Uh, and then just building on what Marnie said about um, testing perceptions at different country levels for, for uh, in addition to public impact modeling, uh, it, it's premature right now to do that. And we did interview um, representatives from NITEGS uh, from around uh, 15 to 20 countries. And Strep A, uh, you know, unfortunately, in, in many cases is still only coming on the radar for some of these countries. A lot of them don't have a great handle on the exact burden in their country. And a discussion on efficacy level thresholds um, just was not possible uh, at this time. Thank, thanks, Don, and thanks, Marnie. Um, uh, Marnie, um, David Castello asks a, a very interesting question uh, related to the lack of significant interest by Big Pharma. Um, and he just wondering if you can comment on that in light of um, uh, Don's presentation on the vaccine pipeline, which seems fairly robust, and your presentation of the highly favorable net present value and return on investment. Um, so maybe Marnie, you can start, and maybe Don, you can you can add your thoughts as well. I think um, which this is also something that Savak will continue to do is 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 creating the case for the need for a vaccine, and part of that is the lack of global um, perceived burden of of strep A diseases. When we spoke to our um, stakeholders across different uh, countries, across different income level groups it really became clear to us that uh, policymakers are not aware of the, the extent of the burden of, of strep A. And this is really part of why the SAVAC is doing all of this work is to, to create that awareness and to uh, get interest from big pharma on the need and, the, and also the commercial opportunity uh, for such a vaccine, not only for lower income countries where there's significant burden um, but also in high income countries where we do see significant numbers of infections um, of pharyngitis, pharyngitis, for instance. Another part of this, which I, I did not touch on and is not, um, was not incorporated at this stage as part of our model, is the potential of a strep A vaccine in reducing AMR. Um, we know that um, antibiotics are used um, extensively for the treatment um, of pharyngitis, um, sometimes in error, and in having a, a, a strep A vaccine, that could also reduce the global burden of AMR. Thank, thank you, Marnie. Don, is there anything you'd like to add? And then I'm going to actually invite David Caslow to uh, to share his thoughts. Uh, so, but yeah, Don. Yeah. The only thing I would add is I think it's really about the perception of the market in high income countries uh, and that that, as Marnie said, needs to be uh, built um, and it's nuanced and it requires um, more work on the burden of disease um, determination um, that obviously SAVAC is leading uh, through another working group. Uh, but I, I think it's it's that perception that it's that there isn't a market in high income countries that's that's really the the quick answer for why big pharma has not been as interested up uh, as of now. Thanks, Don. So, um, so David, um, you know, I guess there are a number of possibilities here, and you may have some insights from other contexts as well. But you know, is it that you know big pharma perceives better opportunities elsewhere? Um, is it that they just don't know about the wonderful opportunity here regarding the development of, a, of strep A vaccines? Um, or are you questioning the, uh, the, the analysis and the assumptions? Um, just curious to hear what your views are here. Yeah, so what I would say is, sorry, I'm going to turn this on. What, what I would say is um, the analysis, at least is, I understand it in big pharma, having been there um, for several years, is they, just in addition to the NPV, they probabilize it and they probabilize it by technical and regulatory and commercial success. And so I guess the question is, is so we've seen the NPV, but now how does big pharma probabilize that NPV and have come to a conclusion, as far as I understand currently, not to invest. And so it would be, so what are the technical barriers? What are the regulatory barriers? What are the commercial barriers? And addressing where the biggest barrier is 
may be the most impactful thing that SABEC can do to generate interest and that sort of thing. And my guess is, is that a lot of it goes to in part the technical, but the regulatory as well, regulatory policy. Good, good point, David, thank you. Um, so I don't know, Marnie, Don, in the stakeholder interviews you conducted, um, what, what did you learn about, about those issues that David's raising about um, sort of expectations and uh, congestion points? Yeah, I, th I think um, to David's question, it's it's really the perception among uh, pharma companies, and we did interview some of those, uh, primarily the ones already in the strep A game. But I, I think D David's point is is um, is bang on, and it's really clear that you know, for one thing, none of these vaccines, you know, none of them have entered phase two trials yet. So we're still resting on immunogenicity data, safety data, and uh, for most of them, only from animals as of yet. But this unclear regulatory pathway, I think, is also um, is also really important. And, and um, so I, I would just I would leave it at that. I think it's it's clear that there's still a lot of work to be done in, in um, cementing the regulatory expectations. And, and we did not speak to regulators uh, about that. OK, thank you. Um, all right. So I have a question that's come in from Wellington, um, and I'm going to actually ask my colleague Dan Cataret to uh, address this question. Uh, the, the comment is that COVID-19 has reshaped vaccine development. This was mentioned earlier. Um, uh, are there any lessons from COVID-19 that might apply to group A strep vaccine development is the question. So Dan, if you can unmute, um, you've just finished uh, work on the development of COVID-19 vaccines, a piece that appeared in Health Affairs, and there's another piece coming out on what we know about the value of vaccination due to COVID. So maybe you can summarize some of that. Um, sure. Yeah. So I think uh, I'll, I'll start by uh, previewing my answer with a, a short answer. The, the, the short answer is yes, I think there are definitely lessons that we've learned from this that can be applied to future vaccines. Um, but the, the, the uh, complication is, is whether, to, to that answer, is, is um, whether uh, the, without the sort of dramatic consequences um, of a disease that has suddenly appeared in the scene, um, staring people in the face, whether those lessons will be um, uh, sort of internalized and acted upon by relevant players. Um, but uh, as David was alluding to, we did just uh, finish recently a work, um, a paper looking at uh, what we could learn from how we got to the point where we're at now so quickly with COVID-19 vaccines. And the, the three, uh, and perhaps this is rather obvious to people, but the, the three um, elements that we identified for how uh, we managed to accelerate COVID-19 vaccine development so quickly uh, were just the dedication of massive resources uh, to the problem foremost. So, um, and, and that's largely, we're talking about money there, but also uh, human resources as well, just from everyone working on, um, uh, you know, the basic research at the beginning, identifying the, the you know, genom genomic sequence so quickly at the beginning, sharing uh, research on preprint servers, uh, publishing, accelerating the peer review timeline in major academic journals. Um, so, you know, there, there's that element. And then uh, new models of cooperation um, are, are a really big point. Um, so some of that, that the groundwork for new models of cooperation was laid prior to COVID-19 with the creation of CEPI, for example. Um, but we now also have uh, COVAX. Uh, we have, um, so international forms of cooperation like that, but also uh, more intensified public-private cooperation uh, through, through things uh, like Oper Operation Warp Speed in the US um, and similar models in the EU and UK um, and elsewhere. Uh, those are the ones that that perhaps we're most familiar with, and then um, and then innovation, innovation in, in both just technical terms um, with you know mRNA vaccines, for example, being uh, approved for use in humans for the first time, um, but also process innovation in terms of uh, having you know overlapping phases of clinical trials, 
um, uh, running uh, clinical trials simultaneously. And, and so I think, I think the, the question becomes, you know, uh, how much of those, how much, especially of the cooperation and innovation pieces of that can we accomplish without the massive influx of resources um, that, that, you know, came, came about because the health and economic consequences of COVID-19 were so severe and so obvious. Um, so I think that's, that's the, that's the big question moving forward. Okay, Dan, thank you for that. Um, I don't see any more questions or comments. And I think David, I, I do think, sorry, I think there were a couple that were marked perhaps by Marnie um, for, for answering live and so they might've disappeared from your screen, but, but there were some, I think on, on the, the costing and also on the difference and um, yeah, I think the, 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 some of the costs came up and there might also be one more in the chat as well. Okay, Marnie, are you prepared to take those up now? Yeah, a couple of I, I questions. Yes. Sorry, a couple of questions came in around our price assumptions. So what we use as a proxy is the pneumococcal vaccine prices um, that are available by country for different uh, vaccine presentations on the WHO MI4 uh, database, and that we also looked at per country level. So we looked at all of the data um, and aggregated it by country income level group, and then um, used the pneumococcal vaccine proxies as, as prices. Thank, thank you, Marnie. Um, I think we have maybe another minute, and um, J Jonathan, I'm gonna invite you to add your thought that you just expressed in the comment to uh, in response to David Castle's question about big farmers interest or lack of interest thus far. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, I guess I was, I, I think it's a, it's a critical question. We have a disease burden that is, um, it is uh, absolutely unquestioned as a, a major cause of death and of disability and of suffering around the world, uh, not just in low income countries, middle income countries, but also in high income countries yet there is no sense of urgency. Um, and uh, let's face it, a farm, big farmer would invest if there was a sense that they were gonna be able to have a decent market. Um, and so we hear from big farmer that there are multiple overlapping reasons, as I said, um, which relate to um, some concerns around the, the technical viability. I think most of those we believe are, are, have been circumvented. Um, obviously issues around, is there a genuine market um, and uh, from their point of view, are there regulatory concerns, particularly what's this issue around safety and how we're going to over, overcome it? Um, uh, but in the end, I think one of the major issues is that uh, what we heard from the Shift Health presentation, that there, that there is not a sense of urgency amongst the particularly decision makers in countries that this is an important pathogen, that these are important diseases and that a vaccine would be a priority for them. And that's um, pretty remarkable given what we know about the disease burden. And that I think has to be one of the number one priorities about understanding how to communicate the messages that we've got uh, much more effectively. Thank, thank you for that, Jonathan. And um, I, I share your point about uh, the need for a sense of urgency. And if there's any group that's gonna create a sense of urgency, it's gonna be SAVAC and it's gonna happen in the next couple of years. So um, I think on, on that point, I just want to thank the panelists and the participants, um, and I will turn things uh, back to uh, Andrew for some closing remarks. Thank you, David, and um, <clears throat> that was a, a great session, and, and I, I guess I'll just finish by, um, I guess, reflecting on the, the session today. So the first thing to say is that, you know, I wish we were all together face-to-face. -to -face. Um, I think one of the strengths of our community um, in, in this field is, um, you know, the interpersonal relationships we have. But, but more than that, I think, is that um, SAVAC and the funding from the Wellcome Trust has allowed that community to expand um, outside of um, just group A streptococcologists. Um, and I think you had, people had, would have had a sense of that um, today during these sessions. Um, but despite not being able to be together face-to-face, -to -face, I think this has been an outstanding um, session with some really inspiring work that's been presented that um, I think allows us to progress and advance the field. I think speaking to some of the, the comments that were made then around the importance of 
understanding um, the burden and cost and um, um, impact of the disease that that David and the other members of the last session and Jonathan were speaking to as part of advocacy efforts. I think that that work is, is really outstanding and we really will progress the field. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot more work to be done and um, you will hear more about this work and we'll be engaging with you more um, as SAVAC um, reaching out to you over the remainder of um, the funding period for SAVAC. Uh, we really intend um, and hope that uh, SAVAC will continue uh, because as David mentioned, I, I think many of us, well, all of us feel that SAVAC has a real key role to play um, in coordinating the international network and around advocacy and um, advancing scientific efforts. So I'd like to thank our speakers, uh, Jonathan, Sharani, Edwin, David, Don and Marnie for your outstanding presentations. I'd like to um, thank um, our organisers, particularly Som Jung, Jean-Louis and Chloe. Uh, I'd like to to um, thank the, the working groups. So, you know, a number of names were, were sort of put up at the end of some of the talks that we heard today. Um, and you can see that there's a tremendous amount of work and a, a large number of people who are involved. And that's it, we, a huge thanks um, from the SAVAC Executive Committee uh, for all of that work. Much of it's unfunded um, and really out of uh, the enthusiasm and commitment of um, people to this field. So thank you very much. Um, a big thanks to the executive committee, including Jerome as co-director, but also Liesl, Sharani, Jonathan, David Caslow, David Bloom, and Edwin Asturias for um, your leadership um, of SAVAC to date. And finally, a big thanks to the funder of SAVAC, the Wellcome Trust. Um, uh, support for this work um, is, is hugely appreciated and um, uh, I do feel and I hope that um, we are making the most of that funding. So, so thank you and great to have you, Elizabeth, on the, on the call today. Um, finally, um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, if you have more questions, please send them in. Um, I think the discussions were, were really um, rich today and um, your contribution to those um, discussions is um, really valuable and I think helps all of us to advance the field further. Um, if there are any questions that weren't answered, we'll make sure that they are answered. And we'll also be preparing a report from today's meeting that will be able to circulate. So from me, I wish you all well, and thank you very much for your um, attendance and participation um, in the sessions today. So as I say, it was a really outstanding session. And I'll just pass over to Jerome for a final um, thank you and farewell. I have a Thanks, Andrew. And uh, I, I don't think I could add anything. You covered all the, the very important thanks and, and the recognition of, of everyone who, who's contributed um, uncompensated time uh, to put together the, the work that was presented here. And um, but very importantly, the work that David is doing um, with the full value of vaccines assessment I think is going to be one of our strongest uh, points for advocacy. Uh, when we have the complete uh, global health investment case as it's extended to all the benefits of vaccination and the business case as well, I think we're going to make it, be able to make a stronger argument uh, to companies around the world that this is uh, a major problem. This is not um, something that will you know, uh, result in, in uh, no identifiable benefit for the company as well, as well as uh, potentially preventing a good portion of the 500,000 deaths a year that are attributable to uh, a uh, infection. So again, uh, thank you everybody. Uh, thanks to uh, Jean-Louis, Chloe and Somyong um, for helping to organize this. And thanks Andrew um, for putting uh, up with the, the difficulty of operating this uh, this large effort uh, through committee. So um, thanks everybody, uh, good night, good day uh, to all. And um, we really appreciate your comments. And again, as Andrew said, if you have any additional questions, please put them or send them in because the final report can contain the answers to the questions. We did this um, last year for our 
scientific advisory group meeting, and it actually resulted in additional very um, healthy discussion. So again, please provide uh, input to the presentations that were made today. Thank you.